been with us uh, before. Uh, you know that it is my inclination to just let this populate for a minute or two. But thank you all for being very, very prompt. It always helps. I was supposed to reach the line out. Hi, Zav. Matt, you're all dressed up tonight. <laughs> what would you like? I, um, I know about the standard to which I aspire. You know, I'm very cognizant of the standard. Yeah. Had I known, I would have gotten out of my gardening clothes. Sometimes I get there. Okay. okay. Um, I think we will, uh, we will unofficially begin uh, now, um, maybe by um, just to, to buy myself one more minute of time to make a, a quick uh, remark about where we are headed next week. Um, and that is on a quick um, trip through a part of Northern Italy called Alto Piemonte. Um, Alto Piemonte uh, on its, on its uh, Western edge um, is in the vicinity of the increasingly famous appellation called Carema and, uh, and moves uh, significantly further East through appellations like Gatinara and Geme and Brahmatera. Um, and we are going to next week be presenting a white wine uh, and a red wine from that part of the world. Um, we'll maybe talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, okay, 6.03 means I can officially begin. I can trust that everybody who wants to be here uh, is here. Um, everybody, I, I imagine, who's tuning in uh, knows about these two wines that we're very, very proud to present this week. Um, both of the wines are, of course, from uh, the Northern Rhone Valley, northern part of the Rhone Valley in France. Um, of course, also both of the wines uh, were made uh, by the same person. Um, of course, you probably uh, by now have heard a rumor that the person who made them is, uh, is with us on this cast. And I caught a quick glimpse of him uh, as I was scrolling. But such is life with the pages, you know, um, you can't tell who's in, you know, slot 37, you know, at any given moment, right? So um, all of those things, uh, the, the, the Northern Rhone, the, um, the same winemaker, the presence of the winemaker, I thought I would begin this, if you'll indulge me in a very, very quick story. It's going to take me you know, a minute and a half to tell it. And it's about the Northern Rhone. And I thought that the telling of this story um, would be a particularly good way to kind of orient at least what my sense of the situation that the Northern Rhone has been in for some of the, some of the last recent years. In the year 2001, uh, I was um, working in my first very, very serious wine job. Uh, I was working at a great Los Angeles restaurant called Campanile. And Campanile flipped my switch with wine um, in a way that it had not previously been flipped. I enjoyed waiting tables and I enjoyed working with nice wine, but at Campanile, everything sort of clarified. I got very, very interested. I started to buy some bottles of wine to put away. Uh, I thought the idea of having my own collection of wine one day would be a really great thing. Um, I was focused then on Napa Cabernet, on very fancy Napa Cabernet. Um, those are the wines that were, get, that were famous, you know, and that were getting high scores and that were expensive. And I thought those were the things to buy. And as I got deeper into considering this process of putting bottles away, I took a quick stop at a very famous restaurant in LA called L'Orangerie. And L'Orangerie was the first place that I ever worked that had a really deep wine cellar which is to say I was working with Bordeaux wines from the 1950s and 60s and some Burgundy and some Italian wines. And that was the first experience that I ever had. At that moment, I got very, very serious about putting wine down myself. And I started to really investigate sort of for my own taste, what it might be that I would wanna buy. The first wine that ever crossed my path that I bought a full case of was a 1999 Cote Roti from a producer that some of you probably are very familiar with called Gigal, right? Gigal is now a very, very famous, once upon a time in the 1970s and 80s, Gigal was just as artisanal as everybody else and was small production. And then Gigal became a very, very, it's almost a house, as close to a household name uh, from the Northern Rhone Valley in the United States as a grower could get. Uh, that's what Gigal is now. I've heard people refer to the current uh, Gigal um, uh, winery itself as being something like um, Disney World. Um, it has, uh, it's very flashy and, um, and kind of fancy. And in any, back to the story about this 99 Cote Roti, I bought a full case of 1999 Cote Roti. Why did I do this? I had heard of Gigal. 
Uh, I already knew that I had a deep affection for the grape Syrah, which is the grape that goes into Cote Roti. And also quite importantly, I was hearing through the grapevine that 1999 was a very fine vintage in the Northern Rhone. This wine was, I think, $30, $35 a bottle or thereabouts. I put together $400 or $450. I went down to the store and I very proudly purchased that case of 99 Gigal Cote Roti. I forgot, I left out one very salient detail, which is that when I left the city of Boston before I moved to LA, I had been given a gift of a half bottle of 1983 Gigal Cote Roti Brunet Blanc, which I subsequently opened when I got to Los Angeles and was the greatest wine that I had ever drunk in my life to that point. It was 2001, I opened this bottle of 83, a half bottle of 83 Gigal Brunet Blanc Cote Roti, and it was utterly spectacular. And that's what sold me on the 1999 Brunet Blanc. What I learned probably three or four years later, five years later, as I got a little bit more serious about this, is that the, the Gigal Brunet Blonde that I purchased from 1999 was absolutely nothing like the 1983 Gigal Cote Roti Brunet Blonde, right? The, the 83 that I had drunk, the half bottle of 83, was maybe made, uh, somebody in the audience probably and who's joining us tonight maybe knows the answer to this, maybe Neil knows the answer to this. Maybe that 83 Gigal Brunet Blonde was made 1,000, 2,000 cases at a time, maybe 5,000 cases at a time. In 1999, I subsequently learned there were 30,000 cases made of that, of that wine. And this is to say, I mean, anyone who has a sort of, a, you know, a sense of, I mean, it takes a sense of uh, scale or scope to understand what happens to wine when it's made 30,000 cases at a time versus wine when it's made 1,000 cases at a time. So this is something that has somewhat characterized these last 20, 30 years, I think, in the whole of the Rhone Valley, is that there, it, it went from a place where there were lots and lots of uh, artisanal and sort of rustically leaning wines into a place where there is now a, a somewhat sizable chasm because some of the Northern Rhone Valley has gone off in a particular direction where they really value um, huge ripeness and an almost kind of sappy quality in wines and almost sweet quality in wines. And there are still, on the other hand, at the moment in the, in the Northern Rhone, there are growers who are practicing extraordinarily traditional methods who are making wines that are throwbacks really to the kind of wines that were being made there two and three uh, decades ago. So I, I thought that that would maybe be, that's kind of a sense of this minute where we are moving uh, in some ways, you know, from in, in, in different styles, you know, we're taking on different styles or, or I'm not, I shouldn't say I am, I am decidedly not. But the, but the growers who are working in the Northern Rhone are some of them, you know, they're moving in different directions. And I think for that reason, it's a little bit of a difficult place to understand. So I am so glad that uh, our friend, uh, who Amy and Chris and I were lucky enough to have dinner with at a, at a nice restaurant in Lyon a year ago, uh, Xavier Girard. Xavier, are you there? Can you hear us? I think we may need to unmute you. Yeah. You are? Okay, Zav. Yeah. Hello. Hey. Hello, good morning. So good thanks morning. so much for, for the organizations and uh, the audience. And uh, that's the first time I use Zoom, so I wish everything gonna work fine, but I'm pretty safe on that. Great. Well, um, let's say first thanks to, to you for the organization. Thanks to Neil also that I didn't knew you was also in the meeting. <laughs> yes. Hello, all of the people I didn't know yet and welcome. Well, so as you mentioned, we're going to taste tonight the two Northern Rhone of the Northern Rhone uh, appellations, which are Côte Roti and Condrieu. So just, uh, I bet you know all of them a little bit about those wines, uh, but let's make just a quick chat. So Côte Roti is the, actually the extreme Northern one. It's about 40 kilometers in the south of Lyon, which is the second city of France. And uh, right there we farm Syrah from uh, roughly the, the first century. So it's kind of very old vineyard, but it's interesting what you mentioned about the 1983, because it's a kind of paradox. It's one of the oldest vineyard in the world, but for let's say between the first world war and the late eighties, this vineyard was about 10, 20% of what it is now. So he almost disappeared and he'd been reintroduced by the, my, my parents' generations basically. So in 1983, Côte Roti was very, very small. And uh, the cuvee you mentioned was uh, from a negotiations, right? But it was also smaller volume. And the appellation is also growing. Then there's also, I consider it all the points you say, but uh, another big uh, vintage uh, difference between 83 and 99. They're both great vintages. 
83 is uh, with probably 85, the two best vintage of the 80s decade. 1990 is also really good, but 1990 was more on a very ripe profile when uh, 1983 was more on a classic maturity. So I would say 83 is more like the profile of, cheers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, you guys start by Marmousin 2015. Uh, this is 14. 14, right, 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 excellent. 14 Marmousin. Cool, so let's speak about this one quick. Marmousin, it's a, it's a single vineyard, and actually 2014, it's very nice to drink it uh, with you uh, this morning because it's a, it's a collector. It's actually the last vintage I did that cuvee. After 2015, it's uh, with another block, which is uh, also in the village of Pondrieu. So let's speak quick about 2014. 2014 is very interesting in my point because it's the highest acidity we have uh, on the Pondrieu for, let's say, the past two decades. So we had a very nice freshness. And it's a bit of a mistake sometimes to drink the Pondrieu over young or over ripe, considering uh, Pondrieu is an aperitive wine. When I think it's a very gastronomic wine, when it's made on a good balance, not to extract, not overripe. How do you um, how how do you describe um, for somebody who is not very familiar with the grape Viognier? Um, how how do you describe it to people? So Viognier, let's say, that, and I'm not a patriot when I say that it's a variety that couldn't travel that well. You know, I'm 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 a Viognier drinker and a Syrah drinker. I have in my personal collection Syrah from many places over the world. When Viognier outside of North Rhone, it's really rare to find a good balance because it could be it could be overripe and you know it, it's a variety that didn't keep its acidity very long. So we need um, some sun in the day and some cold in the night. And in Northern Rhone, we are uh, right on the edge of a uh, small mountains called the Pila, and we have some cold uh, wind coming from the night from this place. So we could have very warm day and very cold night. And that's what Viognier like. So the typical profile would be more like the peach and apricot and violets. But when we are in Convio, it develops more minerality, more complexity. And that's our job to show the, the terroir profile. And uh, that's the things uh, Viognier didn't like so much the wood. It's like, it's one more thing. So now it's kind of fashionable to say a cask is bad on everyone, but I don't agree on that. But especially for Viognier, I think it's not the, the good match. Viognier need la large cask and old cask because the small barrels and the recent barrels give too much oakiness, which is covering the profiles of the, of the Viognier. Like if you ask me Chardonnay, I think Chardonnay match really well with a higher amount of new oak when it's not the case at all for Viognier. So my approach is just to show the terroir. So I have basically two cuvées. And as I say, Marmousin, it's uh, interesting for me because it's the, the last vintage I did it as a single block. I don't know if Neil, uh, you wanted to say uh, a word, please? Yes, absolutely. First of all, I'm thrilled to see you. It's great to see you. And nice to see that everybody's healthy over in, uh, in Condrieu. Um, I wanted to make a point, Xavier made a very important point. The Viognier grape uh, is, a, is a delicate grape. Uh, when I first started working in, in the Northern Rhone in the very early 1980s, uh, the first country I bought was from Antoine Quiron. And I remember I made a comment about this last night when we were on a little Zoom thing with Matt, and some of you were there. Um, those those country in those days were maybe 11, 11 half percent alcohol. Uh, and it was very delicate, very aromatic. What has happened over the years, over the last 20 or 25 years, the wines have become a little bit uh, more dense and more rich. Um, and that many people have started to try and almost do late harvest uh, work with, with uh, Viognier. Uh, I agree uh, 100% with Xavier that Viognier is, uh, is really at its most um, impressive in the Northern Rhone. I think it tends to get a very candied quality to it. It gets a tropical fruit quality to it when it's planted elsewhere, when it gets too ripe. And so um, it's, it, this is one of the instances, this is really the singular area where the minerality shows at its best. Uh, and um, interestingly that Matt, that Matt would mention 1983 as the uh, first uh, coat roti that he had had that certainly impressed him. That in fact was the first vintage of coat roti I bought from my grower in coat, my other grower in coat roti, Bernard Levey. And that was Bernard Levey's first vintage. And courtesy of Bernard and his daughter Agnès, that is how I met Xavier. Uh, and we got together, Xavier did a, a brief stage with Bernard Levey, um, when was that? Wow. What, 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 2009. Uh, 2009, right. And, um, and we got together shortly thereafter and we've been working together ever since. And it's been a beautiful thing to watch the evolution of his domain 
Um, uh, he comes from a very uh, rich background. His parents are rather exceptional people. His father made some beautiful wines in the past, and he's building on a beautiful uh, generational foundation. And it's a, it's a great pleasure to see him become uh, recognized as one of the great growers in Cote Rotee. Xavier. Yes. Um, I wonder, the, the, the business that I was speaking about at the beginning, about um, some of the efforts uh, in the region to make um, bigger wines and then other efforts to make more restrained wines. What do you think about that situation? Where do you think that, where, what's your impression of uh, that kind of, th that style question? Mm, actually, you know, in the wine regions, there's a kind of balance. We need negotiations. And of course, negotiations need, after all, more us than uh, we need them in a way that the, the winemaker always been making wine even before the negotiation system start. But clearly, we have to thank Gigal to make the fame of Cotroti overseas. That's the guys from having bigger volume that also helped the, the region of North Rhone to be famous outside of France. So in a way, you know, he opened some doors that we are already today passing by. So I can't blame uh, for the job he done. Yes. And of course, you know, it's, it's as you say, it's kind of numeric logic. You know, when you grow the cuvee, after all, by having bigger and bigger supply on grapes, of course, the quality would be, could be some vintages less regular. But globally, I'm, I'm thanks for what they did. It's like the third generations, they work, they work really hard, they do their job. They have several QV too. I mean, the, the very premium one is still very interesting, but they could be also about pricing sometime uh, quite high too. But, um, you know, I, I can't blame the, the family uh, for what they don't. I think it's the opposite. The, the Appalachian Code 40 uh, should be thanks to what they, what they achieved. If I can interrupt for a second, uh, Matt and Xavier, I, just to give some historical perspective. When I first visited uh, Ampuy, which is the heart of Cote Roti, where Cote Roti is, is based, um, when I visited in the very, very early 1980s, almost all the growers, nobody was making a living from producing wine. Almost everybody worked a second job, whether they were producing fruit or whether they were working in, uh, working in uh, other, other sectors of the economy, nobody at that time was making a living from selling Cote Roti or, or, or Chondria uh, or Cornas for that matter. And maybe one or two were making a, maybe one grower or two growers were making a living selling Hermitage. But by and large, the Northern Rhone, for all of the extraordinary quality that one finds in the Northern Rhone, and truly there were great wines there in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, um, it, was, it was so unknown and under the radar that nobody uh, was able to make a living by, sell, by making and selling wine. I, I thought. So, that they write, so, it, it, so the point I think that, that Xavier is making, which is a very important point, uh, the, the, the Gossians have dominated the Northern Rhone in many ways. It's not just Gigal. Uh, certainly, there were other negociants that had an important impact there, um, Chaproutier, Jaboulet, uh, etc. Um, but it, it's a beautiful thing to watch now, the extraordinary variety and the presence of all these small estates in the, in the, in the marketplace, which is, um, which is the glory of France, actually. I want to quickly say, uh, before we go any further, um, we have had a a certain amount of success with the chat bar uh, that's on the right side. If you click on the bottom of your screen, it'll bring the chat bar. if anybody has questions, the best thing to do is to type it in there. And the three of us are watching, Chris and I, and our um, uh, um, uh, operations manager <laughs> is keeping a close eye on everything. So um, I think maybe we should uh, think about getting into the coat roti at this point. We can have a conversation about Syrah and about the Appalachian itself, and about the different terroir in Cote Roti. Uh, I imagine Xavier would love a chance to talk about all that. Sure. I would love to lead, too, with a question. Um, and this question is a fairly general one, uh, uh, Xavier, um, and has to do with Cote Roti specifically in comparison with some of the other uh, great regions in the Northern Rhone. We all happen, I mean, a lot of people converging here tonight, uh, happen to love uh, a lot of these communities, including Cornas, uh, San Joseph, Hermitage, of course. Um, but if you had to discount all your friendships with all the producers up and down the Northern Rhone and would sell us on the privilege of making wine and specifically Cote Roti, uh, how would you proceed? 
what is special about coat roti that other, uh, you know, those are opposition uh, that most of would not present. Okay, so as I said, geographically, Cote Roti is the opening of, of Rome Valley when you drive down south. So that's geographically the first thing. Then the soils in Cote Roti are very, very specific because we have a schist and mica schist. So it's a kind of uh, brown rocks that make sort of leaves. And uh, when this rock cracks down, that make a soil lightly clay. And inside Cote Roti, which is very small, so to give you an idea, Scotroti from north to south, it's about uh, 17 kilometers, 15 kilometers, and it's about half kilometers large, maximum. So it's, it's quite uh, long and the uh, thin appellations, and it's all terraces vineyard. So in the Scotroti appellations, 95% of the land is super steep. It's as steep as uh, you basically can't farm and work unless you build it walls. So we build a wall every, let's say, five or 10 meters to hold the, the earth on the, on the hill. That's the terraces vineyard. And those terraces have been built by the Romans. So those terraces, you can find them in other appellation of North Rome. Let's say the, basically the right side of the river, we have uh, six of them. So it's starting Cote Roti, Condrieu. Inside Condrieu appellations, we have Chateau Grier, which is a monopoly. Then you get Saint Joseph. And uh, if you keep going, then you get, uh, after that, Saint -Piret, Cornas and saint Pierre. And the other side of the river, you have Cros Hermitage and Hermitage. So in North Rhone, about the size of the appellation, Cote Roti is quite small, but it's the case for most of the North Rhone appellation. Only Cros Hermitage and Saint Joseph are a tiny bit bigger. To make you an idea, uh, Cros Hermitage and Saint Joseph, it's about 1,200, 1,300 uh, hectares, when Cote Roti, it's about 270 now. So that size is quite specific. And then the last specificity about the size, the geographic, and uh, the terraces, it's also that inside the Cote Roti, we are allowed to use a little bit of Viognier. So we blend a little bit of Viognier grapes in the Cote Roti wines. But they have to ferment together to do co-fermentations. Of course, we can't blend uh, white wine and red wines, but they ferment in the same tank. What is your, um, this is for me, um, Maybe the first, it's definitely the first great red wine that I have had from the Northern Rhone from 2017. Yeah. The first, the first such example for me of, um, of anything um, in the, yeah. of a great wine, you know, made from, from that vintage. What, what's your sense of 2017? A little bit of the red. 2017 is a very classic profile. I like the, the complexity, the richness, and that keep a good amount of acidity. So I'm, I'm very happy with that. And it's the kind of vintage, you know, you can, you can prepare things. Like there were not so much pressure from powdering milieu, from rot. It was a, like a kind of vintage, the work paid, but not so much stress. So I wouldn't say it was as easy for me one making as 2015, but I was not a very, very stressful one. And on the wine, we have a beautiful maturity of tannin, but not without over ripeness. So that's the, the nice things of, uh, you know, you consider that you're drinking a Cote Roti that is not even three years old and the balance is already there. I don't think you're going to be much hurt by the, the tannin and the palate. It's quite soft already. And of course, it could keep aging for um, at least one decade or two. Matt, can I interrupt for a second? You know, there are a couple of, uh, there's a one or two interesting questions on the chat. Side. They're all about, they're all about Condry though. Yeah, okay. oh, so you, want, you don't want to go back, we'll go to, back that. to that in a minute. Yeah, okay. while we're on the Syrah, we'll keep to the Syrah, I think. And, Great. Yeah. Who, who has impressions um, of this, uh, this coat roti? Uh, it says this, 17 coat roti is already drinking well. We expect secondary. Salvia, we got into a conversation uh, um, last night, actually, in the middle of our chat. We got into a conversation about the age worthiness of Condrieu. Yes. What is your feeling about the age worthiness of country? When, when do you want to drink? When do you want to drink the 2014? Uh, I think 2014 start to be on a good phase now. And uh, that's the things of uh, basically most of the wine, but even more the aromatic variety like Viognier. You know, in wine, you get three types of, uh, of aromas, of flavor. You get the primary aroma. So that's basically the flavor you get when you eat the grapes and you find back when you taste the wine. The most classic um, 
image of that is like Moscato, you know, when you eat the grapes of Moscato and when you drink a wine of Moscato, this is 100% primary is aroma, is the just grapes flavor. Then there's the flavors that came during fermentation, that the secondary, uh, secondary aromas, that's more like the, the flowers uh, flavor and all the, all the fat of the wine. And then there's a tertiary, so the, the third uh, aromas is the one that came during aging. And I think in Condrieux, when it's young, the aromas of the, of the fruit, it's covering a bit the minerality. And after four or five years, they start to get that balance. So you still got some fruit, but you get a bit of evolutions and this uh, nice uh, minerality is coming. And of course, it's depending on the cuvee and on the vintage. But I think between, uh, let's say, five and 10 years, you can't get wrong. If the one is well made, you get it. A gentleman wants to know um, what you think the, the ideal age might be for this coat roti, the 17 coat roti. Oh, the potential, I think uh, it's, it's uh, I would say easily 20 years. 20. I, I still has been tasting maybe 20 vintages of the, of the winery. So it's yes. get, a, I think, quite a easy backstage of drinking late uh, bottles uh, in, the, in the tasting room uh, with us. And uh, let, let's say my dad starting Côte Roti 1981 was his first vintage. And out of the, let's say, 39 vintages we had, there's maybe two or three that start to be under, but they, they are all like at least drinkable. And uh, well, considering the profile of 17, I would say the 12, 15 years, you don't take risk, really no risk at all. And when you pass over 20 years, some bottles would be amazing, some bottles would be a bit tired because that's the, that's the key of uh, going very far on aging. We've had some amazing experiences, some very beautiful experiences in, in Xavier, Xavier's parents' home in the cellar drinking older wines that his dad made. Um, I, the 17 here is very deceptive in my opinion because it's very generous right now. It's beautifully balanced. It's very delicious, uh, but I think it has many, many miles to travel. Uh, this is a wine that I think is uh, easily a candidate for 12, 15, 20 years, if not more. You'd be amazed at a well cellared wine uh, that's been well protected over the years. This wine, you know, we have, I have wines in my cellar from the early 1980s from Bernard Levé that are still beautiful drinking of uh, 35, 40 years on. And I think this 2017 from Xavier is going to be in that kind of category. You know, right. I've always said it's one of the reasons, it's one of the reasons why there are 12 bottles in a case of wine. So you get 12 chances to get it right. <laughs> For yeah. wine, it's only three years. It has an amazing okay. balance. And Neil, if you're saying that the journey's only begun, it's a wonderful place to start. Yeah. Well, I think, Bill, by, what you're citing is really the key to the ageability of this wine because it is so beautifully balanced. Balance, as I said last night, when for those of you who were on the on the Zoom call with us last night, balance is a critical element in the aging. It's not so much whether it's powerful or ripe. It's really a question of balance. Uh, that's going to dictate how long a wine will age well. Let me ask about a, a note that um, Xavier touched on a little bit um, in, in the regard of what distinguishes Cote Roti from some other regions. The addition of, of the use of Yonier in, into the Cote Roti specifically, uh, which is a decision that uh, growers uh, uh, make. Um, in this case, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that you are adding a, a small amount of Yonier. Um, some, right. some uh, producers do not, and maybe you can, um, uh, I don't know, speak to that a little bit. Yes, yeah, sure. So the, the addition of Viognier to the Syrah, it's uh, from the notes we have from the, the historical books, basically from the early Middle Age. So that's a very, very old tradition. And so traditionally in the south of Côte Roti, there's a, let's say Côte Roti is, is a big, um, is three villages around but with a, a big diversity of terroir. And in the south, there's schist and mica schist, as I said, but without iron oxide. So iron oxide is basically some uh, orange points you see in the rocks. And on the south, we, we farm with some Viognier in the Syrah from, let's say, the very early age. And in the north of Cotroti, they did not. So that was just the traditions, because at this time, if I'm talking about 100 years ago, it was also some white Cotroti, because the appellations on the, on the wines we're celebrating this year the 80th birthday of Appalachian Scotroti. So sadly, we have to cancel all the festivity because of Corona. 
but that's the you know the laws and the, all the the process we now put on a on the book on the on the right. It's only for eight years, and uh, if you speak about Vionier, that's much older than this. But we keep still this tradition. So in the south of the appellation Cotroti, we plant some Vionier in the in the uh, in the Cotroti block when we do not in the north. So that's uh, it's specific, like historically uh, in the south and not so much in the north of Cotroti. So in the Côte Blonde, we have some Vionier and not in the Côte Brune if you know the, the difference between the two. Uh... Right, so also just to, just to give everybody a sense of geography here, Ampuy is the northernmost village. That's where the Cote Brune is and it runs into the Cote Blonde. And then the villages at the very base of Cote Roti are Toupin and Semon. And those are villages in the south, southern part of Cote Roti uh, where you would find Viognier and it's also actually the northernmost extension of Condrieu. Eric, Eric Brown Xavier would like to know um, if, the, if, if there is a Girard tasting room and when things to normal, if it, it, when things return to normal, whether it will be possible to visit. Go man Girard. So that's, a, as you mentioned, uh, we are like a family size winery. We don't have a specific persons in charge of the tasting room. So we can organize a visit and tasting, but it's only on bookings. So in other words, they, they could send uh, an email and yeah, sure. I understand. Okay, sure. great. Um, and that, you can celebrate Xavier's new, uh, new cellar, new Shea, because he built a beautiful, beautiful installation. Otherwise, you would have had to trek all the way up the hill <laughs> to one of the most right. steep, steep points in Condrieu to find, to find where Xavier used to, used to produce the wine where, with his dad and his mom, right? True, true, true. So that's uh, the new, the new big change for for the winery. These new buildings, so it's all uh, modern and functional. And one of the things I really want to keep, like improving with, was the gravity in the process of winemaking, because um, I like working with wall stems, but stems need ripeness and a really good treat during the reception of the grapes. And for that, you need to be able to use forklift and having gravity. So. It's the things of having the best terroir, but still having a winery that is functional and easy to use. You mentioned uh, a moment ago that you think that uh, Viognier does not travel particularly well. Um, what, are, what are your favorite non-Northern uh, Rhone Syrahs to drink? Okay. Um, how many ones can I pick? One. <laughs> one, you can pick one. <laughs> My God, okay. Uh, I guess I mean to say, are you, are you very familiar with California Syrah? Actually, I had a vintage in California, but yeah. uh, that's when I was just a, a young traveling winemaker. I'm talking about the year 2005. Were you working on Syrah? Yes, yes. That, that's actually, I worked for JC Sellers, which is uh, quite close right. from where you live. They yeah. was in Oakland and they moved now to uh, Sonoma, I think. And uh, well, they were doing very interesting wine, but very ripe. And it's, uh, it's always uh, interesting to see in the diversity, but it's quite far from the approach we could have here. Let's say the, the interesting regions um, in the uh, district of Canberra in Australia, they have good wines too. In South Africa, where I spend uh, most of my young careers uh, winemaker, they also have very interesting wines. Yes. Now there, there is, in South, in, I mean, in South of France, they also start making nice era. There's some good terroir that start to show off from high elevation in Roussillon, like uh, La Tour de France would be nice. So it, that's why it's hard for me to pick one, because uh, I don't like so much the ideas of superlative in one, because it's, it's so subjective. You know, my favorite one is not going to be especially yours, and uh, picking one like this and awards is not so much my approach. But let's say the, I'm, I mentioned three very interesting regions. Coastal right. region in Africa, Canberra in Australia, and I think uh, Autour de France in the uh, in South could be some interesting terroir for the future. Thank you. That's, um, Zav, a, um, a gentleman who is a friend of the restaurant, um, wants to know about uh, something that he is describing uh, as a usually um, a feeling of glycerin uh, or richness in Condrieu. And, right. um, and as, he, as George puts it here, this feels like it has less glycerin slash richness than usual. Why is that? Is that, is that acidity or what is that? 
Mm, alors, actually, there is the in in the tastings. Neil says something very interesting. Everything you can feel, it's about in balance with something else. And so, as I said, 2014 get the highest acidity we have for the two last decades in Convio, and the acidity slow down the perception of fat and slow down the perception of alcohol and slow down basically the perception of maturity. So, if you roll, the things you see on the side of the glass and the fat in the wine is made from the, uh, the skin of the grapes when the grapes get really ripe. So, for example, if you drink a, a late harvest made from noble rot, you're going to have a huge amount of uh, glycerol. And also the noble rot is raising the glycerol by so much. I don't like noble rot at all. So when I see some berries that go to noble rot on my uh, whites, I just do sorting, I throw them away. Because I think the, the Conrio is amazing for his complexity, his bouquet, but his lake would be the, I mean, the excess of fat. So that's a, I, I really took it as a compliment to say you don't have so much fat, because right. that's really my goal. Holly, Holly wants to know, besides the history of blending the, the, a, a small amount of Viognier into Syrah, what um, flavor does the Viognier introduce in, in your coat roti? So first of all, we need to speak of the proportion. So the Viognier, it's about three or four percent in the blend. So that, that's still, uh, that's not nothing, but that's not dominating. And the interesting point of view, the Viognier, I think for me, it's actually what we don't want so much in the Condrieu. It's like the, the young, uh, on the young goodness of the, of the wines of the Cote Roti, that fat we got in the, in the Condrieu is coming to the Syrah and it's also opening the bouquet because the Viognier is super aromatic when it's young. So that's, um, you know, the way I don't want to go too far in the Condrieu, that's the things that, that bring into the Cote Roti. And you have to consider it another point. Viognier is about 10, 12 days early on Syrah, on the maturity. And when we pick the Cote Roti, we pick them both on the same day. So when you do Cote Roti with a bit of Viognier inside, the Viognier inside the Cote Roti is overripe. So that's bringing more fat, because as, as we mentioned just before, the glycerol is coming from over maturity. And the only times on 39 vintages I didn't do Viognier in the Cote Roti, that was actually on the year 2013, because in 2013, the maturity came super late and the Viognier were going too far on noble roads before even the Syrah were even ready to pick. So I picked the Viognier super early and I declassified into my uh, entry-level Viognier. So Great. in Viognier 2013, there was some grapes from Cote Roti uh, Viognier inside. I don't know if I answered the question properly, but... I think you did, I think, and then some. Does anyone have um, a last question or two to um, put to Xavier or Neil while, he's, while we're here? Any um, last questions, Chris? Yeah, I can, I can ask one. Uh, last year, this time, we all convened in a bistro in Lyon, oh. and you guided me to something super typical on the menu um, that, uh, you know, andouillette, a sausage uh, made of intestine. <laughs> Yeah. Um, which was, it's an, uh, you know, suitable to be had with wine, but what do you like specifically to have with your coat roti or even more, you just know, can, I would just want to clarify first that it's a, it's a, it's not, <laughs> when we originally, Chris told this story a couple of days ago, the sausage, the casing is intestine, but the, the stuffing of the sausage is also intestine, <laughs> All right? Just so everybody has the right idea. It was not just the casing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, yes, as you mentioned, Andouillette is a, is, could be a classic because, as you said, also there's different profile Condrio, but the, the very classic one we got here is asparagus, like the, the veggies. Yes. So, Neil would enjoy that too. So, it's a, it's a big, big classic because the first guys that was showing Condrio very well, even inside France, even before it started to be exported, was a very famous uh, chef called Fernand Point. He was a three star for all his carriers. He was based in Vienne from the restaurant La Pyramide that still exists today. And that was the guys that show off Condrieu and Asperger's. Then the other class, scallops works really good, the, the shell. Um, let's say we have a very, very famous cheese regionally, but that didn't export uh, outside uh, Rhone and outside France. It's La Rigotte de Condrieu. So it's a small la goat. Rigo. So just say La Rigotte. Rigotte de Condrieu. So Rigot means river in our dialect, in the northern language. 
So that, that's a small um, aged cheese that is um, a bit creamy outside and quite uh, intense inside, but not overripe. And that there's a very interesting parallel to do. It's from a young condrieu with that cheese when he's young and when he's aged and when the wine is aged too. Then, um, yes, I think that that's already for a good match you can do with condrieu. Terrific. But Andouillette, it's, uh, it's made from, as you say, inside the, the stomach, but it, it's pretty tasty and balanced. And it's, you know, I surprised you, but even the old French guys, they eat that in the morning. <laughs> I'm coming back for more. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be back there and I, you know, it tastes, uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, you get used to these things. You can't uh, judge anything the first time you experience it. You have to go back for more. Xavier, can you, can you speak just for a moment about climate change? Right, right, but, right. Not in general, but with regard to your vineyards and your wines. Okay, so that's a, it's a very interesting and actually super, uh, super strong subject. Uh, as, a, um, as a citizen of the world, first, I'm, I'm very worried about that. It's a thing we, we, all of us should think of it. And I think the corona outside all the bad things he would bring to a lot of us in our own family, including mine, I think it's gonna also help people to think of uh, burning less carbons. And I agree that uh, it's a huge, huge thing. But if you speak about specific Northern Road, we had a succession of uh, four warm vintages in a row, which are 15, 17, 18, 19. And before that, we have 13 and 14, the one you're tasting today, 14, and the previous one, 13, that was two of the coldest. So if you speak about climate change effect on the wines, we have to consider it, for example, the past 100 vintages compared to 100 vintages in a row at Jesus Christ time, for example. But we can't consider the global warming's effect on my wines on the, on the level of my careers, because we're not watching, uh, you know, you can't compare meteorology and climatology, it's two different science. But of course, the, the fact of having warmer and warmer vintage could push on higher and higher maturity. And we could have some tricks as a winemaker to fix that. So that's basically from double picking, it's what I do on the white. It's like I pick half the blocks, when I get a warm vintage, it's the case not on the 14 you're tasting now, but on the past uh, five vintages, I did that four times. I pick the blocks two times. So I pick half the grapes at under maturity when it's about 11.5, 12% alcohol. So when I have the, the crease, the acidity and the fresh in the wine, but no flavor yet because the flavor are coming later. And I pick the second half about 10, sometimes 14 days later. And the second half would be like 15.5, 16 alcohol, but with a huge aromatic, and then I blend them both. And that's actually the, the trick to play on that, to keep a good balance without using tartaric or any uh, entrants I don't like to use in winemaking. So we have, some, we have some competence, we have some technique to fix that. But I don't think personally global uh, warmings would affect the quality of my wine in the future. Whatever, I really believe in global warmings and I'm worried for that in my, uh, in my life daily. Hmm. Thank you. Um, how is uh, how's life um, with COVID-19 uh, in Conry and Ampuy? So basically there's a super heavy restrictions. So we can't work uh, so much outside of uh, farming and buildings, but farmers and builders, they're still allowed to work outside. And basically, every other job, they have to uh, work from home. Le let's say that, I think we're taking, all, we're taking over. It's slowly, uh, you know, when we check on the, on the statistic, the people in the eye care in hospital is going down slowly. And from um, May 12th, like in next week, uh, two weeks, they're going to start to reopen some shops and to slow down, go back to normal. Mm -hmm. How is it doing in California? California, at least Northern California has been very, I'm knocking on wood, but Northern California has been very lucky um, with, with a very low occurrence of cases and a low occurrence of deaths both. Um, so, uh, other questions, final questions. I didn't mean to leave that on, <laughs> on a sour note. Um, no, I, we Matt, have, Matt, yeah, I, you know. I just one last note I would like to make because the last yeah. comment that, that Xavier made about how he is dealing with the uh, climate change and, and the impact it's had on his, on his work, uh, I think is a very important point, not just um, with respect to uh, uh, his approach is a really wonderful humanistic approach. 
Um, and, and I think it's very important that we note that people like Xavier are respecting their craft uh, by making adjustments with how they work with their grapes and when they're making their picking. It's certainly a lot more difficult to go back into a vineyard a second time or a third time or a fourth time to pick through the grapes to decide what you're going to pick when. Um, it is much easier to manipulate the wines in the cellar afterwards with all the technology that's available right now. The fact that Xavier is making the effort to pick to make the decision, for example, to pick some of his Viognier when it is slightly underripe and pick the rest of it when it is slightly overripe in his attempt to make certain that he has a balanced wine, I think is one of the, is, is, a, is, a, is a great statement about his dedication to his craft and rejects this notion that we can fix, quote, fix wines uh, with some sort of with, with the, uh, the additives and all kinds of manipulation in the cellar. That is a very, very critical difference and it is what defines a, a great domain in my, in my opinion. Mm. But the point of technology, it's mostly uh, about cost. I, honestly, when people use more technology is to, under, to limit cost and to limit risk. That, that's the two points. Mm -hmm. Like uh, it's, it's about being, as you say, going to the vineyard during maturity every day or at least every second day and, and check uh, how the maturity is moving. I do, uh, since my first vintage, I worked on the farm with my dad, 2004. I do a full notebooks of maturity from every block. And that's also helped me to, to know how each block would, uh, would, would evolve. But sometimes, you know, the wind is coming from south and the vineyard south facing, they would override super quick. So from having a backstage of 16 vintage, 17 vintage uh, behind me, that helps so much to understand the maturity of each block. But if you consider it the domain, I'm, I'm farming seven hectares and I'm going to be eight hectares because I planted one hectare of Saint Joseph I finished uh, last week. And uh, out of those the small seven hectares, I have nine vineyards. So it's, it's nine vineyards that you need to drive to each of them. And in one of them, I do three different maturity. It's a Le Molar in Côte Routy, so that's the art of the cuvee. And from only this block, I do three tanks from a single vineyard. So it's really just personify each side of the block, each vineyard. Thank you. Pleasure. Well, yes. Um... Matt, one, one last comment from me. I'm sorry, I keep, uh, I keep interrupting here and prolonging this, but I, I want to make another point. This is why we at Rosenthal Wine Merchant never refer to our producers as winemakers. Uh, they are vigneron. Vigneron is a much more complex term. A winemaker is a technical, uh, somebody who does things technically about wine to make wine. A vigneron is a person who works the, works the vineyards, crushes the grapes, produces the wine, and is all things to all. To all uh, it is a critical, critical difference. The word vigneron for me is just a, has a very, very special meaning. And that's why I, um, I am repelled to a large degree by the term winemaker, which for me is an indicator of some sort of, you know, sort of technical... Um, Canary. Well, it's not necessarily chicanery, but it is a it's a it's a it's a technical process of quote making wine. We don't make wine. Um, you know, it is a, it is our work with the in the vineyards and with nature that is what produces great wine. I think that that is a, a, an exceedingly salient point, and I am um, I am very very glad that you um, that you mentioned it. So and it's great for me to see uh, a, a, a vigneron like Xavier Girard, who is continuing the traditions of his parents. And that is exactly what we count on to keep the, uh, to keep the integrity of, of what we do, of our work. Terrific. Let, let's say to, to close the circle, when you start speaking first of negotiant winemaking, to end up on the, this last chat, you know, to make great wines, it's not about fixing the problems, it's about anticipating the uh, anticipation. So making sure the problem are not coming, like the over maturity, when you pick the grapes over up, it's already too late. And when you're a vigneron, you plant your vines, you, you farm your grapes. So every time you know the problems would come, you have to anticipate that and just make that there's no problem coming. That's the only way. So it's the, the skills we could have as a vigneron is like when you do everything, it's easier to manage everything. It's a soup to nuts operation. 
Yeah. Right. Which is the way it ought to be. I agree. I think that's right. Next, next week. This is a, a white wine that I mentioned from, um, from the western part of Alto Piemonte called um, the Canavese. Um, it's a, a wine that is made by an increasingly famous uh, family uh, called the Ferrando family. They make a, a wine called Carema that is uh, very sought after. Um, this particular wine is a white wine made from a grape called Erbaluce. Um, lovely grape, lovely vintage, um, probably this is one of these wines that I've never had a vintage. As, as you may or may not know, Chris and I have not tasted these wines until we pull the corks on them with you. Every week, next week, unfortunately, it'll be just us. You won't be lucky enough to have two um, celebrities here joining us. Um, but Chris and I will do our best to um, offer some uh, salient ideas about this Ferrando Erbaluce from 2017. I will start by mentioning that I have never had a drop of this wine going back 10 or 15 vintages that has been anything less than unbelievably generous. Uh, this is not a wine that is uh, holding anything back. It's um, a very expressive wine and it comes in in 2017 at 12.5% alcohol, which is, that should be interesting to taste. Um, the second wine that we are working with is um, a wine from a grower called Rovolotti. Um, the Rovolotti family uh, has been situated in the, an appellation that I mentioned at the beginning called Geme um, in Alto Piemonte. They make absolutely first rate uh, wine mostly from the grape called Nebbiolo, um, which is the workhorse of, um, of, of the whole of Piemonte. Um, this wine uh, we are lucky enough to be tasting from the 2013 vintage, which is not only uh, significant because it's seven years in the bottle already, um, but also because 2013 was a very, very brilliant vintage in Piedmont. Um, so a couple of really wonderful uh, northern Italian wines coming up next Saturday. The following Saturday, I'd be, I, I'm very, very excited to tell you we are doing a cellar dive for our first time. We are moving back stateside in six weeks of doing this. And we are gonna feature two wines from Bob Lindquist uh, and Cupe label uh, going back almost a, almost a decade. Uh, we'll be pouring uh, two wines from 2012 the following Saturday with Bob, by the way. That'll be our second time we um, were joined um, by, by someone in this case as wonderful as Xavier and Neil. Um, what else do we have to say? We're coming home. Neil and Xavier for staying up late, I think, getting up early. I mean, this is. I uh, think we should have actually a, getting up early. A more morning. Yeah, they stay up late. My guys. Staying up late and Xavier. Please show. Thank you. So was it espresso or eau de vie? Yeah, that's was a good it, question. Was it espresso or eau de vie? Bill wants to know. Zav, <laughs> what is it? Just water. Mineral <laughs> water. <laughs> you're a, you're a purist. So <laughs> Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. We'll see you all very soon. I was soon. wondering if you sure. like this. Can I, I check if there's some question? Can I answer now or will be done? Yeah, yeah, we won't cut it off if there are questions. That's so funny. Yeah. I mean, all certainly right. there yeah. was a couple of people, you know, asking about whether the you Molly? Okay, what? the Viognier with the Syrah. And I believe the answer is yes, but maybe you can enlighten us. It's co-fermented. Is it, it is co-fermented, yeah. love? Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Can you, uh, do you want, should we explain what the difference is for a lot of people? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Can what you is, explain Xavier, more? Xavier, what is the difference between co-fermenting and blending? So co-fermenting, basically, they stay in the tanks with the rate. So the, the, parti the, the, the amount of Viognier you put in the syrup participate to the extraction. So they stayed on the skin which is not nothing because the skin of Viognier is quite thick. It's a, it's a heavy skin. So it's not gonna bring anthocyanin, which are the colors, but they're gonna bring some tannin. So they're not diluting the structure because we extract from the skin of the Viognier some tannin. In other words, in other words the Viognier and the Syrah ferment together in the same place. If you blend later on, which is not allowed, you wouldn't be allowed to do this to make it coat root two, Coat Ruti, you would have made the Viognier separately and you may ferment the Viognier separately, you ferment the, the Syrah separately, and then you put them together. That's the blending process. But that would not happen here. Right. Last questions. I think it's, is it bedtime okay. now? Are you, are you gonna start work now or are you going back to bed? Yes, well, I, I can do that quick. Oh, you can show us the winery. Just, ah, how lovely. I was in the office. I don't know if he works with the webcam so much, but... The narrow room. Oui? C'est bien? Yes, okay. 
Because the Wi-Fi in the winery is not terrific, huh? <laughs> we, he, so that, we that's like the run. new winery? We had a test run a couple of hours ago and he froze a couple of times when he was in the winery. The Wi-Fi is not great, but so far it's Yes, great. that was the idea first is to do it from there, but there's also a bad sonority, a lot of echo. Yeah. You sound great. It's all perfect. So that's the bottle storage there. I wish I could show you the vineyard outside, but it's pretty dark. It's, uh, it's like 3.50 in the morning there, but... <laughs> Uh, well, basically, just from outside there, when it's night, there is La Côte Châtillon. Côte Châtillon, right there. Yes, we are exactly facing Côte Châtillon from... Uh, oh, wow, that's great. We have to give Xavier some uh, MTV Cribs Last uh, training for this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> training? In what, George? All right, guys. Thank you very much. Hope you're happy. Bye. We'll maybe see you next time. Thank you, Xavier. Bonne nuit. Thank you. Merci, Xavier. Thank you. Merci, au revoir. Don't try. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Amazing. Cheers. Thank you.